It is, a, it is a distinct privilege, Heavenly Father, for us, members of your royal family, to draw ourselves apart from the many pressures of life, from the mundane demands of everyday living, to a place in which we dedicate the next hour or two for the purpose of contemplating who and what you are and learning more about you. When we consider the amount of time we spend uh, watching television and uh, absorbing all of the onslaughts of the world system as it enters our soul through our eyes and ears, when we think of all the time we spend in the devil's world functioning as your royal family, bombarded on all sides, the, the few hours that are dedicated per week to the taking in of Bible doctrine, to the sustaining of our Christian uh, relationship with you, to the advancement of our spiritual uh, situation, and to having fellowship with you, enjoying you, worshiping you, praising you, and adoring you as we study together is so, so short and so, so very, very limited. And yet it is a privilege to have at least this hour or two on this Sunday morning, during which time we can contemplate who and what you are and draw closer to you through the study of your word. Now as we set apart this time, may the Lord Jesus Christ receive honor and glory, I ask in, in his name, amen. We're studying the doctrine of the grace of God. God's middle name, as I call it, because it is so characteristic of what God is like. God is grace, and there is nothing quite like grace. And yet it's an amazing thing that in a recent book by George Barna, in which he does a survey of the world uh, of believers in the United States of America, though, uh, though it he's dealing only with believers in this particular survey, 86% of the believers think that they are saved by grace plus something else. Something in addition to the grace of God. And so it is so important that we understand what grace is all about. How confusing and confounding it is when people sing about grace and talk about grace but they know nothing about what grace is all about. A number of years ago, a book came out written by a very prominent uh, evangelical uh, entitled, Grace is Not a Blue-Eyed Blonde. It was at the time when uh, Grace uh, Kelly, was it, uh, who became the Princess of Monaco, was very popular. And uh, uh, that was about what everybody thought grace was. Well, what is grace? If I were to ask you at this point of time to discern, define the difference between these three words, would you be able to do that? Could you tell in language which is discernible the difference between grace, mercy, and love? They are not the same, and they should never be considered to be the same because they are vastly different, although they are related to each other. You see, mercy is you're not receiving what you should get as far as judgment is concerned. A merciful God withholds judgment, but He does. He can only give you mercy because he's a God of grace. Love, and I'm particularly thinking here about the agape love or unconditional love. Now, unconditional love is important because it accepts the per you, it accepts everyone on the basis of its own character. But unconditional love doesn't give anything. Grace is the only thing that gives something on the basis of being totally unearned and undeserved. 
dependent on the gracious character of the giver. So grace includes love, it includes mercy, but it is infinitely more. Love can say, I'll accept you with all of your idiosyncrasies, with all of your sins, I'll accept you. But grace bestows a fantastic salvation upon this undeserving sinner, which has been delivered from judgment on the basis of the character of God under mercy. But they're not the same. Not interchangeable words. Not synonyms. Grace includes love and mercy, but it is so much more. Grace is the most glorious word in the English language when it refers to who and what God is and when it comes from the source of God. And later on, because, and I believe this sincerely, I believe that the reason we don't see more orientation to grace on the part of believers is because they don't understand what grace is all about. If they did, they, there would be orientation to grace as far as believers treating others in grace. For it's one thing to accept someone, it's another thing to treat them in grace. It's one thing to say, I will love you, but I don't have to have anything, any, any relationship with you, than to treat you in grace, which says, I will not only accept you, but I will do something for you. I will go out of my way to bestow upon you things that you have you never have earned or never have deserved. I will give you the things that I, in my character, would to, would like to give you in order to bless you, to make you happy, to to do for you on the and and advance you in whatever situation you find yourself. So grace is so much more than mercy, so much more than love. Let's take a few sub-points here. Under sub-point B, under the definition and explanation, spent some time uh, uh, last time uh, going into the uh, principle of the seven propositions about grace. Now we're working on the several concepts of grace. And this will be, uh, this will form an ongoing definition. First of all, grace is not free. Grace is free to you. Grace is free to me. But grace costs God everything. Grace always costs the person who gives. If it doesn't cost, then it's worthless. It costs. It's very expensive. It costs God the uh, all everything from the uh, kenosis to the incarnation to the hypostatic union to the death on the cross. Uh, all of it. it costs God the Son everything to provide grace for you. Therefore, grace is what God is free to do for the undeserving mankind on the basis of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, beloved, now God is free to do for us everything. In fact, I put it this way. God is now unlimited in what He can do for us. Not, notice I'm not saying that He's unlimited in His love for us. That's, that is the point of John 3.16. God did love. He's unlimited in His love, no, no doubt about it. But you see, He's also unlimited in His grace, which does something. 
uh, His love accepts us, but His grace does something for us. People who don't understand the 23rd Psalm at all. The 23rd Psalm isn't a psalm for every believer. I mean, they think it is, and you go, every time I have a funeral, uh, even the unsaved people know about the 23rd Psalm, and they, if you ask them if they have a pa favorite passage of Scripture, they'll always say, oh, the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm has nothing to do with the average believer. The average believer doesn't experience any of the things in the 23rd Psalm. Those are for people who are mature believers, super grace believers, believers who have advanced. They're the ones who could say these things are true of them. All of the things. I shall not want for rest, for refreshment, for uh, all the things that are listed in there. Uh, the people, the very people that I have to read it for at the funeral. I, though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. They're sitting there full of fearing of evil because they don't know anything about it. And it ends up, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Terrible translation from the Hebrew. It doesn't say that at all. Goodness and mercy following you. What does that mean? Have any idea what that means? It doesn't mean that at all. It's grace and goodness shall pursue me all the days of my life. God is literally running after you to pursue you, to bestow upon you things that you don't have the slightest idea He wants to do for you. Isaiah 40 tells us that God is literally tapping His foot in anticipation. He is uh, impatient, waiting for the opportunity to bless you. And He is unlimited in what He can do for you. That's why uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the, the life beyond dreams, this is uh, that it, uh, it has, it's beyond what you can, uh, above and beyond what you can ask or even think. God uh, has for you above what you ask, above what you think, because He's unlimited in what He can do for you. And grace is going to do that for you. Grace is, is now set free to, to, to bless you on the basis of His character because the absolute righteousness and justice of God have been satisfied by the perfect person and the perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's why we call it, it's really called the grace pipe. That is, it's a pipeline that flows from the essence of God. Once His righteousness and justice are satisfied by the work of God, of Christ on the cross, now uh, everything that the essence of God can conceive will flow by means of grace to the uh, object which is the believing sinner. We have an idiosyncrasy, and we had in, in, in my bathroom. Could never understand it. The cold water, when we first moved there, was working fine. But in the tub, there, there are two what are the handles, you know. These are handles, and there's a spigot that comes here. And it was working fine. You'd get in the shower, turn the uh, hot and cold, and then come out mixed but, you know, eventually it came to the place where, for some reason or other, the cold water kept becoming less and less and less, which meant that if you put the hot water on and you put the cold water on full blast, you'd roast your gizzard because it was so hot. So turn off the, the hot water, turn the cold water on, and it, start, it would just sort of drizzle out of there. There was... I couldn't figure it out. So you'd, you'd come to the place where you'd turn the whole water on first, then you'd add a, enough hot water so that you wouldn't roast yourself. And look, here, here's the shower up here, you know. Let me, let me draw a shower head. And instead of coming out like this, it would come like this. It just falled out. It was terrible. I had a fellow come out, plumber, and he took the thing apart and and he ran uh, something up uh, this, uh, and he said, well, there's something there. I don't know what it is, but it's something there. So he had to tear the whole business out and replace it. And uh, what a difference. 
what a difference it made. There was something constricting the flow of the cold water so that it was just down to a drizzle. Now, who knows what it could have been. It could be anything, you know. I didn't find all the pipes and go through them because I figured I was glad enough to get the water. But I, I knew the result before, and I knew what after he worked, so I knew he had done something, and so I was willing to pay him. But, see, there's nothing now constricting the grace pipe from bringing to every member of the human race, particularly, however, his royal family, uh, everything that his, uh, his uh, total essence can come up with that would be for, for you and for me. Even, even for the, the unsaved, uh, he makes the sun to shine on the, the just and the unjust. Uh, he blesses the human race, and you and, can and see the, the, the Old Testament psalmist never could understand it. David couldn't understand it. As much as David knew, as close as he was to the Lord, he never could understand it. Because he kept on asking, why do the wicked prosper? And there are believers who look at, be, at, at unbelievers, uh, vicious people, horrible people, mean people. Uh, uh, people who are uh, the epitome of evil. And uh, they say, well, how in the world can God bless someone like that? What are they saying? They're saying they don't deserve to be blessed. I do, but they don't. See? They're evil. I'm not. How can God bless them the same as He blesses me? Yes, I deserve it. They don't. See, they don't understand the first idea of concept of grace. Nobody is blessed on the basis of whether they deserve it or not. I don't care if you're the finest believer who's ever walked on the face of the earth. You will never deserve anything from God. And that's what grace will teach you. So that you never ever have the attitude, after all I've done for him, how can he do this to me? And yet that is an attitude, whether it's spoken or unspoken, by the majority of believers, particularly when they're going through any time of difficulty or heartbreak or setback or adversity uh, or loss of a job or loss of health or loss of, of a loved one or a loss of whatever, any kind of loss. How can God do this to me? Implication, after all I've done for Him. But you see... We live in a society where performance is rewarded sometimes. But God says performance is totally put aside. I am free to, in, to be unlimited in what I do for the human race because of the work of Christ. You must understand the, the complexities of the, of the essence of God. When we first started this church 24 years ago, I determined one thing, that if the kids in our school, uh, Bible school, our prep school, our Sunday school, whatever we call it, and our kids' clubs learn anything, they must learn the essence of God. You cannot function if you don't know the essence of God. Sovereignty, absolute righteousness, justice, love, eternal life, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, immutability, and veracity. We even have a little song that, that they helps them to learn it to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, that they can go through this and sing the whole song and they want to come down and it says, for sovereignty, and go right down, down, till they come down there with the right point. Now, this the word essence tells you that this, these are the characteristics of God. Now, understand this. God must be consistent with himself, and not one of these characteristics can be compromised when he blesses mankind. Therefore, the cross becomes the only means by which... God can remain consistent with himself, uncompromised, and still bless the human race.
Turn to Romans chapter 3 for just a moment. When we come to Romans chapter 3 and we begin in Romans uh, 3, 20, 20, 22, we begin to come to God's explanation of what he has done to take care of the problem which has been raised in the first three chapters. He begins in the first chapter to talk about what we would call the, uh, the heathen, that is, the person who uh, comes to the point of God consciousness and rejects that. And uh, so he is the heathen. That's the human race uh, in general. Then we come to the second chapter, in the first 16 verses, and we pick up the, the self-righteous man. And the self-righteous man says this, Well, I'm certainly not like that heathen, and uh, he looks at himself and he says, I'm a much better person than the heathen, therefore I'm acceptable to God. And God says, no, no, you're not. You're in the same boat. But then we come to the religious person. And God picks out the most religious person on the face of the earth, the Jew. And he says, uh, the Jew says to himself, well, uh, yeah, I, the heathen obviously doesn't deserve anything. Self-righteous man. Uh, doesn't need God, but but he's self-righteous in himself. But look, I, I worship God. I go through all these things, uh, and certainly I'm acceptable. And God says, no, you're not. So the, the uh, when it comes to, uh, up to uh, chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 21, we have God's conclusion that all of the human race is under condemnation. That, that not one of these has earned or deserved anything from God. So in verse 22, he begins by saying this, this righteousness from God. How do you get a righteousness? He says, this righteousness comes from God, you'll please note, from God, through or by means of what? Faith. Faith is non-meritorious. Not by rationalism, the use of your mind, that would be meritorious. Not by empiricism, the use of your senses, that would be meritorious. But by means of faith, which is non-meritorious. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and are, now please note, are justified freely by His grace. What does justified mean? Justified means to be declared righteous. So you see that this, this righteousness comes from God by faith as God declares the sinner righteous by means of what? His grace. That is, this declaration that you are righteous in His sight comes on the basis of grace and grace alone because of, the next words, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. God was just. You see, we go back to this. God's justice demands that sin be punished. It has to be. God just doesn't overlook sin. God doesn't turn the other way. God doesn't turn his back on it. Sin is sin, and sin must be punished. Unlike many parents who say, uh, well, uh, they, they think that they're being gracious in withholding punishment from an aberrant child, they say, well, uh, okay, I love him so much. God loved the world, but he punished sin. The thing was, he found a substitute for the aberrant child and punished the substitute. He punished the aberrant child's substitute. And that substitute was the Lord Jesus Christ. The justice of God could not ever be bypassed. 
It could not be compromised. The Bible um, says the wages of sin is death. And therefore, there can be no way that God could say, well, let's forget about that. Let's overlook that. Let's just lay that aside and forget about that demand. No way. He can't do it. Verse 26, he did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that, here is the, the point, so that he could be just and he could be one who justifies those who have faith. Change the word just to righteous. For that's the same word. It, that means it's righteous and righteousness. So that he could be righteous and the one who declares righteous those who have faith in Christ. See the dilemma that God faced? How can he be righteous and at the same time declare righteous the, the sinner? There's no way he could do so as long as he was also justice. Now we talk, we, we hear song upon song about the love of God. And the love of God is wonderful. The love of God says, uh, yes, I, I, will, I love this poor helpless, lost sinner down here. But you see, the love of God stands right here, and it does nothing. It can't do anything. Because the justice of God demands that that sinner be punished. Because the wages of sin is death. And so the love of God stands here helpless and hopeless. It can't do anything until the justice of God is satisfied. Now, therefore, God in His fantastic sovereignty comes up with a plan that is so unique and so marvelous there's not a member of the human race could ever think about it. Let's find a substitute for this man. Well, now, wait a minute. Where is He going to find a substitute for man? Suppose He finds another man. But, see, this man is also a sinner. Therefore, he's got to pay for his own sins. He can't pay for somebody else's sins. You can't pay for somebody else's if you've got your own ones to pay for. And so if, if your own sins demand punishment, then you can't be punished for someone else. So therefore, God has to find a sinless member of the human race. Uh, there ain't none. What a condition. Therefore... Is God going to just say, oh, well, I'll forget about my justice. The soul that sinneth, it must surely die. Scratch that out. No, he can't do that. He cannot be just or righteous and overlook the unrighteousness of the human race. I love the story of years ago, when I was, I came off the, Indi the uh, Ohio Turnpike onto the, the local road, and the, the t Turnpike, you know, had the high speed limit. It was 70 at that time. And in Ohio, the nighttime speed limit, I think, at that time was 50. They had a 55-day and 50-night speed limit in Ohio. I came off the Turnpike and onto an Ohio road, and I'm sp coming along, and all of a sudden I saw this flashing light in my rearview mirror and I pulled over to the side because I knew as, as soon as I saw it, looked down and I saw I was doing 60 miles an hour 10 miles less than the speed than the speed on the turnpike but 10 miles more than the Ohio speed limit and I the, the fellow pulled up you know and the officer got out and I happened to be coming from meetings, and I had my Bible up on the up on the, the dashboard of the car, the window. And as he comes, he you know he looks through with his flashlight, and he he says, uh, "Are you a minister?" I said, "Yes." He said, "Reverend." <laughs> they love to do that. Shame on you! I felt you know about that small, just about that small. And he said, he said, well, I have two choices. I can be just and give you a ticket. 
Or I can be merciful and not give you a ticket. But he said, I can't be both. Is that right? Exactly right. There's not a judge, police officer, law enforcement officer in the world who can be both. Now, to be just, well, I, let me t finish the story and say I got off with mercy, not justice. And from that time on, I, I was like, that, mercy, 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 not justice, justice, justice. I don't want mercy. I don't want justice. I want mercy. That's why, beloved, you don't pray what the Lord's Prayer says. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Who wants to be forgiven like that? There are too many people you don't want to forgive. That means you'll never be forgiven. Forgive us on the basis of the finished work of Christ. That's it. See. No, God is the only one, the only one who has devised a way to remain just or righteous and at the same time be able to take this sinful human race and do something about it. And the way was... The plan was that God, the Father, came up in eternal, at a conference, eternal life conference in eternity past called the Doctrine of Divine Decrees. And God the Father came up with this plan. God the Son said, I'll do it. I'll do what, you, what your plan calls for. God the Holy Spirit says, I'll make it clear to the human race because they'll never understand it apart from re divine revelation. They can't possibly understand something like this. I wonder if they did have a little joke and the Holy Spirit said, Oh, God, the Father, they'll never understand this. The human race can't understand this. And God, the Father, says, All right, you tell them. I, I, that's not Scripture. You understand that? That's poorly imagination. But here it is. The member of the Godhead who is div divinity, co-equal, co-eternal with God, the Father, and God, the Holy Spirit, adds to his perfect deity perfect humanity but he has to be put to the test in all points like as we are and still remain on positive volition because you see Adam was perfect humanity too but Adam when he was put to the test what failed the test and so this member of the human race is perfect humanity he has to be put to the test will he go on negative volition at, at any point in his lifetime and therefore be like Adam, become a sinner? Answer is, absolutely not. He was put to the test in all points like as we are yet, totally apart from sin. Therefore, when he goes to the cross, see, he is qualified to become that substitute that we need. The substitute who could be punished in our place. And so, it, it becomes the means by which God can remain consistent with himself and still provide blessing for the human race. And the coin of the realm, that is, that which has purchased our redemption is called the blood of his cross. The blood of his cross speaks of his expiatory work, don't be afraid of big words, his expiatory work on the cross. And because of his expiatory work, expiation, the doctrine of expiation, God is propitiated. Another big word, but a perfectly good word, means to be satisfied. God's righteousness and justice are satisfied and man can be reconciled to God and sin removed. So that God now, to be free and consistent with his perfect character, can now look down at this uh, negative righteousness. Uh, maybe, he's, maybe this person's better than others and, and, or worse than some. But whatever it is, it still doesn't come anywhere near measuring up to absolute righteousness. And therefore, God allows this grace pipe to flow to this man. There's, Beloved, there's not enough that God 
can do for us. That's the thing that, that galls me about the ignorance of grace. Ignorance of grace is, is satisfied with a few little crumbs. And uh, it's sort of like uh, having uh, your children uh, sitting around the dining room table and you're eating well, and one child is bad, so you say to him, you go under the table and we'll, you eat the crumbs on the floor. Well, the Christianity is most Christians sitting on the floor eating the crumbs along with the dog when they should be sitting at the banquet table enjoying all of the riches of His grace, which we will deal with under the second point, saving grace. But the point is, the grace pipe tells you that God is unlimited in what He can do for you. And God is not sitting up in heaven saying this, oh, do I have to? Do I have to bless this idiot? Or how little can I do for him? How little can I do for her? No, it's not that way at all, folks. It's the other way. God, God wants to do so much. God wants to do so much. There are some of us who are parents who are, who are like that. We, 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 have, a, we have children. And uh, uh, I had four children. And no two were the same. And I could never treat the four children the same. Because they're not the same. You, uh, parents pride themselves on treating the children, uh, their children all the same. That's ridiculous. You can't do that. You can't treat your children all the same. You can love them with an unconditional love, but you can't treat them all the same because different kinds of uh, personalities, different kinds of responses and reactions require different kinds of treatment. And suppose you have uh, a child here and you, uh, it is possible as a parent, beloved, let me tell you, it is possible to actually be hurting inside because you want to do something for this child, but because of demonstrative immaturity, you know you can't do it for them. Because if you do do it for them, it will destroy them. And you cannot allow them to destroy themselves. And therefore you have to withhold, and it literally hurts you to withhold what you want to do for this child because the child doesn't have the capacity. There's so much that you would do for that child if the child would just grow to the place where they have capacity. And that's what God says. God literally wants to pour under the principle of super grace. And we'll study that under the third facet of, gra of, uh, of grace. But he has, he has such things under super grace, and we already talked about life beyond dreams that he has for you. All right? Three, sub point three. Under the principle of grace. All right? The first one, the basis of grace. The second one, the means of grace. The third one, the principle of grace. Under the principle of grace, God has allotted to every person on this earth, X number of days. That's already written down. And under the, for these X number of days, God has provided perfect blessing and this perfect blessing is a part from any merit, any ability on your part, any planning on your part, 
Any thinking on your part. Any energy on your part. Any behavior on your part. Or any morality on your part. It has nothing to do with anything that you are going to be able to put up to before him as the coin of the realm to buy. All of this are means by which you would like to use to buy the blessing of God. But the principle is that he must bless on the basis of his character not on the basis of yours. And therefore, you'll find under the principle of grace that God wants to do for you something fantastic every day of your life. The sooner you reach the place of capacity, of spiritual advance, the sooner you get here, the sooner you become the recipient of these things. Now, suppose you delay. Let me show you something in the, in the example of Abraham. Let's take Abraham here. Now, God has planned the blessing of a son. Now, maybe that's not what you consider a blessing. Maybe it's a boyfriend, <laughs> depending on who you are. It could be all kinds of things. As some gals, you know, they get hard up for a boy and they take any, any uh, uh, crumb that comes along. All it has to do is wear pants. That's all it has to do, and they're satisfied because they have such a lousy self-image of themselves, they say to themselves, well, that's about the best I can do. Well, sure, but it's not the best God can do, let me tell you that. God has somebody special for you, see? Now, wait a minute. See, Abraham could have had that son all the way back here, but no capacity. That's why he goes to uh, Eleazar and said, you could be his servant. So, you be my son. And God said, Ixnay on that, they, I reject that. That's your human invention. Uh, that's your, your idea. Sure, not mine. That's not your son. You're not going to enjoy Eleazar as your son. Time goes by. Finally he comes along and they get, and, and he says, uh, Sarah says, uh, listen, you take Hagar and uh, you have a son with her and let him be my son. And Abraham says, Great, wonderful idea. Let's do it. God says, nope, that's human solution. And so along comes uh, uh, Ishmael. And with Ishmael comes uh, T. And T stands for trouble and trouble and trouble and trouble and trouble. Trouble between himself and his wife, between Hagar and his wife, between uh, Ishmael and him, Ishmael and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Sarah. Trouble. Finally, he's 99 years of age, and he reaches the place of spiritual capacity. God gives him the son, Yitzhak, laughter. He could have had laughter all of this time, but he has sorrow all of this time. He has tears all of this time. He has trouble all of this time because he does not advance to spiritual capacity so that God could give it to him. God had it all planned. God would have given it to him way back here. But you see, he wasn't advancing spiritually. So think of all that he lost out on. And here is God. Remember I said tapping his foot, just waiting, waiting, waiting. No wonder they named him, him uh, Yitzhak. Of course, it was named because Sarah, when she heard that she was going to be pregnant, laughed. She said it couldn't be possible. But it was also significant that here was the one who was going to bring laughter into their home. Here was the one who was going to bring joy into their home. But had to wait for 99 years. 
because, and he didn't earn it or deserve it at this point. It wasn't that he, he earned it or deserved it. No, 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 don't under, misunderstand it. The only reason he got it here is that he had grown to the place where he had the capacity for God to give him the son. And when he finally had the capacity, God gave him the son. It was never, it's, you never buy anything from God. You never make a deal with God. God, if you'll get me out of this situation, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Hogwash. God, if you'll, if you'll do this for me, you, you, you give me a million dollars, I'll give you back a half a million. No, 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 no. Okay, God, if you'll, if you'll do this, I'll serve you. you know, if you'll do this, I'll do that. No, no. There is no way you can ever make a deal with God. It's always going to be on the principle of grace, on the basis of His character. Or it will not be at all. Four is the policy of grace. So that's the fourth word that we're dealing with. Basis, means, principle, policy. On the policy of grace, here it is simply stated. God gives, man receives. That's the policy of grace. No strings. God does all the work, all the providing. Man does all the receiving, all the benefiting. Therefore, everything depends on who? God. And this means, folks, that you can never go to God and say, after all you've done for me, I want to serve you. Don't ever insult Him that way. All the service that you could give can't begin to repay God for what He's done for you. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no respite know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross I cling. And that starts with the cross and goes on through life. There's the old chorus we used to sing. After all he's done for me, after all he's done for me, how can I do less than give him my best and live for him completely? After all he's done for me, or something like that. My, I never carry the right tune, but that's the right words. You want to give him your best because he served you, because of what he's done for you? Don't ever, don't kid yourself, folks. You can't begin to pay back God you can't get it, be, pay him before. You can't pay him after. You never can repay God. All you do is come as a, as a simple child and you simply say, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and so free. You don't, you, you receive and you don't try to pay back God. A uh, young man uh, who attends uh, the midweek and he now had a change of his schedule came and uh, told me that he was going to be unable to come because he's now that his job has made some changes he can't come but he he wanted the tapes and at the same very same moment uh, Diana brought up a big stack of tapes she had made for him and he was embarrassed because uh, I said, listen, anything we can do for you, let us do. He said, yeah, but I can't, I can't afford to give it. Any. He said, I know it's grace, but... I said, no, you don't know it's grace. If you knew it was grace, you would not argue with me. You'd take it. See, you, you, you don't understand grace, but I don't blame you. Nobody understands grace, really. Very few of us understand grace. Listen, you take every tape that you want, every book that we want that you want because it's grace it's grace and you cannot earn it you cannot deserve it and to offer to God to say let me give you five bucks God is an insult to grace you stand beloved with nothing in your hands except what he places there and you don't go that way 
It's what He places there. And your gracious God has given it to you, and you respond in gratitude. That's what eucharisteo means. The word for thanksgiving is eucharisteo, and the middle part of that compound word is charis, which is grace. You are graced out. And the policy of God says, I give, you receive. That's all. Take it and be grateful for grace. Thank you, loving Lord, for this part of our study. As we continue it, may God, the Holy Spirit, use the rest of the words that we're going to look at to uh, be able to com comprehend in some way with our finite minds the matchless, glorious, wonderful grace of a wo matchless, wonderful, glorious God. In Jesus' name, amen.